So this morning we uh, had uh, several talks um, concerning hygienous uh, moduli spaces. Um, I will switch gears a little bit. I will work in a fixed genus, in particular genus zero, will be the arena for uh, the next uh, hour or so. Um, but I'm interested in what happens when we take the number of boundaries of a hyperbolic surface to become large. In particular, what can we say about the global geometry of such random hyperbolic surfaces. Now, it turns out that when it comes to global geometries of random metric spaces, combinatorialists and probabilists, uh, of which I guess half of them are here in the room, are very experienced in uh, doing this uh, using combinatorial techniques. And kind of a vital technique in the, kind of the, the precise study of the geometry of random discrete surfaces in the sense of planar maps relies on bijections between surfaces and trees. So what I want to, to discuss for you today is that this bijective technique of counting discrete surfaces, discrete uh, planar maps in terms of trees, has a very close analog in the setting of hyperbolic surfaces and Walt Peterson volumes. Um, so the works I'll talk about there will be one with uh, Nicolas Curien, which really deals with the, the situation where I only have cusps, so boundaries of length zero, and the more general tree bijection that I'll actually be discussing is a more recent work with uh, Bart that you've already seen uh, yesterday, and uh, Thomas Mosen, who was a master's student uh, before. Okay, so first things first, how to transition the slide not be too far from the receiver. Um, our setting is, of course, the moduli space of hyperbolic surfaces on genus G for now, but as I said, we'll uh, zoom in on the planar case very soon. Um, so we consider all hyperbolic metrics that I can put on a surface of fixed genus and fixed number n of boundaries to which we prescribe a certain set of, uh, of lengths. So these boundaries, they should be geodesic and they should have lengths that are specified by us. Now, we've already had some definitions of what is a hyperbolic surface uh, yesterday. Uh, so think of a hyperbolic surface as a metric on your surface that is locally isometric to the hyperbolic plane. And for me, the hyperbolic plane will always be represented by the upper half space with the Poincaré metric. And just for you to recall, maybe I have to stand on this side, the geodesics in the upper half plane, they are the half circular arcs that sit on the real axis, or the vertical lines. And of course they descend to geodesics on my hyperbolic surface. Okay, so here's an example of a four-hold sphere and of a two-hold torus. Okay, I have to stand here. Okay, very good. So how can we describe this moduli space of hyperbolic surfaces? Well, the natural way is to consider a pair of pants decomposition that Hugo yesterday already mentioned. So if we can find a collection of disjoint simple curves that dissect your surface into three whole spheres, so into pants, then we have a very effective way of describing this metric by specifying the lengths of the curves along which I cut the surface, and then noting that these pairs of pants that I produce have a geometry that is uniquely specified by the boundary lengths. So in order to produce, for instance, a four whole <laughs> sphere, I have to take two of those pairs of pants, glue them together, of course, along boundaries that have the same length, and then the only remaining freedom is the twisting between the two pairs of pants. Okay, and this particular description of hyperbolic surfaces is also very nice to equip the moduli space with a canonical metric that we've already heard about a couple of times, which is the Wall-Peterson volume form. And in terms of the lengths of these uh, cycles and the twists, these are called fenchel nielsen coordinates on the Teichmüller space. This canonical measure is simply 
the Lebesgue measure on the length and twist variables. And okay, Wolpert has shown to us that in fact this measure is independent of the chosen pair of pants decomposition. And note there will be some factors of two hanging around, not only on this slide, but on the remaining slides, but essentially it's due to this uh, power of two prefactor of the, uh, in the definition of the wall peterson measure. Okay? Now famously, one can integrate this wall peterson measure over the full moduli space I get the well peterson volume that now depends not only on the genus and the number of boundaries, but also on the fixed boundary lengths. And Mirzakhani has shown to us that in fact, it's a polynomial in the squares of the boundary lengths and pi squared, a rational polynomial in pi squared. Okay, so here are a couple of examples. So the well peterson volume of the pair of pant, so genus zero with three holes, it is one simply because if I fix the three boundaries, there is a single surface. For the four hold sphere, I get this uh, polynomial that is symmetric in the four boundary lengths and it's a uh, quadratic. Okay, and the degree of the polynomial, of course, increases when I increase the number of boundaries or I increase the genus. Okay. Um, so in this slide, I want to highlight the analogy between Walt Peterson volumes of uh, surfaces with boundaries and the combinatorics of maps. And already this morning in Elise's talk, um, this uh, analogy featured, and it's actually more than an analogy, because we know that if we take <coughs> the boundary lengths of a hyperbolic surface to become very large, then the surface really resembles a ribbon graph and similarly, if I take the face degrees of a map to be very large, then it also resembles a ribbon graph with real edge lengths, so a metric ribbon graph. Okay, but I don't want to look at these particular limits. I want to look at the exact uh, enumeration and volumes and uh, make a comparison here. And I'm interested in any number of boundaries. So if we want to say something about Walt Peterson volumes for any number of boundaries n and fixed genus, or the number of maps with any number of faces, but again, a fixed topological surface, then it makes sense to look at generating functions. So what are the natural generating functions in these both settings? Well, in the case of the maps, what I can do is I can sum over the number of faces of the map sum over the degrees of the n faces, and then count the number of maps that have those faces, and view that as the coefficient of a monomial, where now I have generating variables, q, with a sub-index that is the degree of that face. Right, so I can encode the complete enumeration problem of genus G maps with an arbitrary number of boundaries of arbitrary degree in this power series, this formal power series that depends on an infinite number of parameters that are the generating variables for the number of faces of that degree. Okay. So what is the analog you could do in the Walt Peterson volume side? Well now, also I want to sum over all number of boundaries that I can have. Um, but now the boundaries, they have some real length and I want to be able to extract again from that generating function the Wall Peterson volumes with a specific length. So the natural analog is now not to take this infinite sequence of generating parameters, but to select some kind of measure Q on the positive real line, and then integrate our Wall Peterson volume against a measure that they associate to each of the boundaries. Now really, I don't want to go into any measure theoretic uh, discussions here. How we should think of this Q is some measure that can integrate against the polynomial. In fact, it's a, uh, a even polynomial. So really, this quantity on the right-hand side is only going to depend on the even moments of this measure on the positive real line. And if I know how my, uh, my, my, my generating function, Fg, 
depending on this measure, looks like, then I can extract from that all Walt-Peterson volumes of that fixed genus G. Okay, please stop me whenever I say some apra cadabra. Um, I'm going to focus on the genus zero case, but before I go there, I want to mention that these two kind of grand generating functions that a priori might be quite uh, complicated um, satisfy you know, very nice properties. For instance, that they satisfy an infinite hierarchy of uh, differential equations in the case of maps. And note I'm restricting to bipartite maps where all faces have degree that is even and all cycles have the even length. If I sum all those generating functions for all genus, then it's known that the exponential of this is a tau function of this integrable hierarchy. And in fact, this kind of determines, together with an initial condition, the full set of generating functions. Similarly, it's well known, going back to, to Witten's conjecture and Kontsevich proof, combined later with the work of Mirzakhani, that also these generating functional well Peterson volumes when summed over all genus form a tau function of some integrable hierarchy that is in this case the, the KDV hierarchy. If you prefer topological recursions, equivalently we can specify this is that there is a spectral curve that generates all these generating functions by a recursion method while the, the uh, bipartite maps also satisfy such a topological recursion with a slightly different spectral curve. <coughs> okay. Um, so let me now zoom in on the, uh, the planar case, g equal to zero. And it's known that one of the, you know, the equations of these integrable hierarchies completely determines the genus zero partition function. And I can massage this equation into what is the physicist called a string equation, which is an equation for one of these uh, second derivative of the genus zero partition function. And really, what is the interpretation of this particular second derivative? Well, this R of Q is just a generating function of planar bipartite maps that have a root, so a distinguished oriented edge, and a marked vertex that I will call the point. So these are pointed, rooted, planar maps. Again, carrying a weight depending on the degrees of the faces. So the string equation, it is of the form of a closed form kind of power series equation for this generating function R. And therefore, uniquely determines its solution. And if we know the solution, one could integrate this equation to get the full partition function, okay? Now assume as a combinatorialist sees a closed form equation for a generating function of combinatorial objects, then one would like to have an interpretation of this equation in combinatorial language. And what should such an equation look like? Well, it seems to tell us that such rooted pointer planar maps decompose, okay, either it's a trivial object or it naturally decomposes in a k-tuple of rooted pointed planar maps in a number of ways given by this binomial. <coughs> right, so there should be some natural decomposition of planar maps in a tree-like fashion. And indeed, such a, a tree uh, interpretation has been determined, and this tree interpretation has been vital for the understanding of the geometry of these maps. If I look at the Walt Peterson volume side, then the natural analog is to look at okay, a derivative of my partition function with respect to the measure that I associate to zero boundary length. Okay, this sounds a bit formal, but really this is just the power series I have up here, but instead of Vgn of L, I have Vg of n plus two, and then the first two boundaries have zero length, and then I have a arbitrary number of boundaries of length L1 up to Ln. Okay, so R of Q really now is a generating function of all Peterson volumes of hyperbolic surfaces that have two distinguished cusps, two distinguished boundaries of length zero. 
And if you then look at your KDV hierarchy and you extract the error in the slide transitions, let's try again. Okay, yes. Okay, there is a bit of a delay, okay, so I have to coordinate this a bit. Um, if we re-extract, now, the string equation for this particular generating function, you find an equation that looks very similar to the string equation for maps. And what are these coefficients in the power series that appear there? There is a first term that depends explicitly on the weights that they put on the boundaries. So this term is actually very similar to the term that I had here. In fact, there is a one over k factorial squared in front, and here in the binomial is also a one over k factorial squared. Um, and really, the analogy between these two terms exactly relates to what I said, that when the boundary lengths become large and the degrees become large here, essentially both are enumerating metric maps. The hyperbolicness of this problem is really contained in this gamma k, which is some alternating power of pi with some factorials, okay? Um, I think in Alessandro's talk uh, this morning, it was already noted that these kind of generating functions are related to generating functions of intersection numbers. You should understand the first part so the dependence of my generating function on these tk's as being the generating function of the psi class intersection numbers. And we know to go from psi class intersection numbers to Walt Peterson volumes, you have to introduce kappa class uh, intersection numbers in the game. But these have a relation to the psi class intersection numbers. And the relation is exactly the shift going from tk to tk plus gamma k. So really we need to understand, if we want to understand kind of the, the geometry of these surfaces, the role of this contribution with the alternating powers of pi. Okay. Since we have a closed form equation, there should be some recursive uh, decomposition of these surfaces. In particular, is there a tree interpretation of this equation? Can we find trees in those surfaces? Um, so this becomes especially important when we talk about random surfaces. So instead of thinking of this object up here as a generating function, you can think of it as just encoding the probabilities of a random map. Because if I normalize the summon I have up here, by one over gg of q, then that's a probability that I assign to a map with these faces of particular degrees. So the probability of sampling a map, which you call a Boltzmann map, is proportional to the product of the weights with index equal to the degree of the faces. Okay? So these Boltzmann planar maps were already introduced by uh, Emmanuel in the lightning talk yesterday. So similarly, I can think of a random hyperbolic surface. Now, with a random number of boundaries and random boundary lengths, by taking a probability measure, which is really the product measure of the Wall-Peterson measure, so that sits in this uh, Wall-Peterson volume, with the products of these measures on the boundaries, normalized by one over n factorial and one over the partition function. So this is what we call a Boltzmann hyperbolic sphere. Okay. Now on the planar map side, we know that if we take these weights Q to be positive real numbers that are sufficiently regular, if we sample a Boltzmann planar map, condition it to have exactly n phases, and we turn our map into a metric space by considering the vertices of the map, 
equipped with the graph distance between the vertices. And we normalize this graph distance by the number of faces to the power of minus one quarter. That, when n goes to infinity, this metric space converges to this very nice universal random metric space called the Brownian sphere. Okay, so this is a random continuous metric space with some Hausdorff dimension equal to four. It still has the topology of the two sphere. And there are some relations to Liouville quantum gravity that I will not discuss. Okay, but in particular, if I look at the diameter of a planar map with a large number n of faces, it's typically of order n to the one quarter. And this quarter, the four here, is directly related to the Hausdorff dimension of the continuous limit. And as I said, the trees have been uh, monumental in establishing this limit. Um, so naturally, we can ask the same question for Boltzmann hyperbolic spheres. So what if I condition on the number of boundaries to be m? Then I can look at the metric space given by the hyperbolic distance on this surface. Then as n becomes large, what is the typical scale of these distances? What is the diameter of these distances? And if I normalize by that diameter, is there some limit in a gromov hausdorff sense of this metric space? Okay. So let's start on the planar map side, and I'll discuss for you the, uh, the tree bijection that is uh, uh, important here. And the uh, tree bijection that is most analogous to the uh, hyperbolic setting is the uh, Bucci di Francesco Guitare bijection, which is a bijection exactly between the set of maps that I described here, so the rooted pointed maps, and certain trees that are called mobiles. So what is a mobile? It's a bicolored plane tree, which is rooted at the bottom. So we have alternating black and white vertices. And the white vertices are labeled by integers, such that I put the label zero on the root of the tree. And the only condition on the other vertices is that whenever I walk around the black vertex in a clockwise direction, then if I see a vertex with label L, the next one has to have label at least L minus one. Okay? So how does this bijection work? I start with my pointed Okay. Let's see. I've got my personal copy. Let's see if this one functions better. Ah, never rely on the pointer of the conference organizers is my lesson. <laughs> okay. Ah, no, no. Ah. So I'll switch every, every 10 minutes between pointers and then we can see afterwards. Oh, no. <laughs> Now oh, then it's the USB uh, plug. Okay. There we go. No, we don't go. <laughs> It was worth a try. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. So we have our pointed planar map. What we do is we label all the vertices by their graph distance to the point. 
Then, inside of each phase, we put a black vertex. And there is this little menu that tells me that now I look at all the edges of the map. And I look from smaller label to largest label. And then, I draw a red edge in the face that sits to the left to the vertex that I've drawn there. Okay? So for instance, for this edge, I draw a red edge that points to my new vertex. If I do that for all the edges in the map, then what you'll see is that the red graph that I've now drawn in the plane is exactly of the type of a tree if I remove the original edges of the map. Now I'm not going to explain why this is a bijection, but we can draw some immediate conclusion from this because if I look what happens inside the face of the map, um, then if the degree is a 2k, it had to be even, remember, then the number of times that my label increases when I go around the face is of course half of that, so k. So to a face of degree 2k will correspond a vertex in my tree of degree k, a black vertex of degree k. Since this is a bijection and the generating function of these maps was called R, R is also the generating function of these trees where I have a weight Q of K for each black vertex of degree K. So this immediately leads to this recursive equation that we had on the previous slide. Namely, a mobile is either a trivial mobile consisting of a single vertex, or it must have a leftmost sibling, which essentially is the root edge of the mobile, ending on some vertex of degree K, and then everything that is hanging from the white vertices that are the children of that black vertex are of mobile type again, up to some shift of the labels on this tree. So that means that I have a natural decomposition of a mobile into a collection of K mobiles. And the only thing I have to take into account is what are the labels on the children of that black vertex. And you can easily check that this takes into account this binomial factor. Okay? Um, it should also be clear that this tree encodes something useful about the geometry of the map. Because essentially the labels on the tree are the distances from the white vertices to the origin. The only thing I've done is shifting all the labels on my tree such that I get a zero on the root of the tree. So if I have a white vertex with label one, it corresponds to a vertex in the map whose distance to the origin, in this case three, is one larger than the distance from you know, the root vertex to the origin. So clearly these kind of tree bijections have to do something with distances towards some distinguished point in the surface. And this is the key idea to extend the tree bijections to hyperbolic surfaces. And it turns out that a nice origin to choose, a nice distinguished point in your surface, is not just some arbitrary point on the surface, but it's a cusp. So we will be looking at hyperbolic spheres that have a distinguished cusp. Now, as most of you will know, if I have a hyperbolic surface, I can look at its universal cover, and if this were a closed hyperbolic surface, then the universal cover would have been the whole hyperbolic plane. But if we have boundaries, then those boundaries actually correspond to geodesic arcs in the hyperbolic plane. So really, the universal cover of a hyperbolic surface with boundaries is some large infinite polygon in the hyperbolic plane. And my origin will appear a countable number of times on the boundary of the plane. It turns out that these kind of surfaces are not so pleasant to work with. Exactly because its universal cover is pretty complicated. Instead, we'll be dealing exclusively with hyperbolic surfaces to which 
to each boundary, we glue a hyperbolic funnel, which at the level of the universal cover simply corresponds to replacing my polygon by the whole hyperbolic plane. And then if I quotient the hyperbolic plane again, but now not the polygon, but the full plane, I get exactly the surface with the funnels attached to it. Right, so a funnel is really kind of a cylinder with a single geodesic boundary that has the same length as the boundary of my surface. Okay. Then what I'd like to do is consider distances towards my marked cusp, my origin cusp. Now, as you may know, cusps are infinitely long, so we have to be a bit careful in defining this. Um, what we can do is we can choose a little horror cycle around this cusp. So a horror cycle essentially is a curve that is at infinite but constant distance from a cusp in the sense that it's perpendicular to all the geodesics that run into this cusp. In the hyperbolic plane, this horror cycle corresponds to a little circle that sits on top of the real axis. Okay? And as soon as we have a horror cycle, we can measure distances from any point in my surface, say outside of this horror cyclic neighborhood, towards the horror cycle. In particular, I can find points that have two shortest geodesics realizing this distance. It's easy to see in the upper half plane because there will be points for which two of those little horror cycles are closest to the point and at equal distance. And these points in the neighborhood that also have two shortest geodesics will actually lie on a geodesic that kind of bisects the two uh, horror cycles. So if we look at the spine of the surface, so this is a spine in the sense of Bowditch and Epstein that we already heard of in uh, tomorrow's, this morning's talk by Elisa. Um, but it's slightly different from the usual spine construction in the sense that I only look at distances to a single cusp instead of distances to all boundaries in my surface. So as I said, all the points that have two shortest geodesics to this horror cycle actually lie on geodesic segments in my surface. Now if I trace such a geodesic segment, segment such an edge of the spine, then at some point I will reach a situation where there is another horror cycle at equal distance. And then it's clear if you look at the in a little neighborhood of this point that it corresponds to <coughs> the merging of exactly three geodesic edges of the spine. So in general, the spine of the surface consists of a collection of geodesic edges that either end on a point where it merges with two or more other edges, or it does not end and runs all the way to the boundary of your hyperbolic space. Okay? Now let me argue that this spine is actually a tree in this case. It becomes a tree if I compactify these infinite boundaries into a point. Because if I do that, and I look at the complement of my spine together with those points at infinity, then by definition, this complement is all the set of points that have a unique geodesic, shortest geodesic that runs into the origin. So I can retract this whole complement into a neighborhood of the origin. And the origin has a topology of a disk, so the, com so the whole complement should have the topology of a disk. And that essentially implies that my spine is a tree. Okay. Now here's something important. I want to study the combinatorial type of my spine as a tree. And the fact that I've included these funnels is important to distinguish different combinatorial types because it can happen that edges of my spine only meet inside of the funnels and not inside of my, my hyperbolic surface with boundaries. Okay. 
So we have a tree associated to any such uh, cusped hyperbolic sphere with additional data that we have to put on top of this tree to characterize the geometry I started with. So let's have a look. To do this, we construct a canonical triangulation of the surface. So as I said, every point on an edge of the spine has exactly two shortest geodesics to the horror cycle at the origin. And you can easily convince yourself that those geodesics meet the spine at equal angle. Okay. Now what happens if I trace out a whole segment of my spine? then the geodesics to the origin will trace out a pair of triangles. And these triangles will be mirror images of each other. In particular, there will be angles associated to these triangles. So this is a triangle that has some finite angles, phi 1, phi 2, at the vertices of the spine. And one angle that is 0, because it runs all the way into my, my cusp. In particular, if I look at the area of this triangle, in hyperbolic geometry, the area is pi minus the sum of the angles. So we immediately see that the sum of those two angles will always be smaller than pi. So let me record the angles of you know, the triangles, and they uh, agree pairwise, as labels on the ends of the edges of my tree. I can do this for all edges of my spine. For instance, for this edge, which is a slightly different type because it's actually of infinite length running into one of the funnels, the triangles that it sweeps out, they have a finite angle phi 3, but now two ideal vertices. So here, I only have to record an angle on this edge, this end of the edge, and the angle at the other end of the edge where it touches the boundary is zero by construction. I can continue if I have a region in between two spine edges that run to the boundary. The shortest geodesics from the endpoints of those edges, so these green curves, they carve out an ideal wedge. An ideal wedge is really in the upper half plane, simply a strip. So it's a, an infinite area uh, kind of surface that has here at the top a zero angle, an ideal vertex, and at the bottom an, well, an infinite length part of the boundary of your hyperbolic plane. Okay? But there is just one ideal wedge up to isometry. So that one I will you know, draw for each corner of a boundary vertex. <coughs> If I do this for all the edges and all the corners of my vertices, I've completely covered my hyperbolic surface. And it gives a kind of triangulation, or actually it's a triangulation, if you like. If I want to reconstruct my surface, well, the geometries of all those triangles and wedges is now uh, uniquely determined by my angles. I only need to re-glue them. Now this is easy whenever I have to glue two triangles because remember one of the sides of the triangles or the, the sides of the triangles that run towards the origin are of infinite length or actually half infinite length because they start at some, some point and then run off to infinity. So there is just a unique way to re-glue them. You just start put them together at the tip and uh, paste them together. So those gluings are unique, but whenever I look at the gluing of a wedge to a triangle, then the interface is bi-infinite. It's isometric to the real line, so there is a shearing freedom. So in order to you know, specialize the full uh, surface, I would have to introduce some shearing for every time that I glue a wedge to a triangle. Okay? But then it should be clear that I've uniquely specified my hyperbolic surface. Okay. 
Um, so how can I specify these, uh, these shearing coordinates? Well, it turns out that if I look at the region of a single boundary of length L, the way that my spine edges run into the funnel can be characterized by a partitioning of my boundary into a number of segments that is exactly twice the number of spine edges running in. So what I need to do is I need to record the sizes of the segments in this partitioning. And to give you a bit of idea how this works, if I want to examine you know, the, the area around this funnel, I can go to the uh, universal cover. So how can I describe a funnel? Well, one way was by giving you this, this vertical strip and identifying the left and right side of the strip. But after a Möbius transformation, I can also write it as the identification of two geodesics that are now sitting on the real axis in such a way that my closed geodesic, which is really the boundary of my funnel, is aligned with the imaginary axis. Then the Möbius transformation of the upper half plane that maps this geodesic to that geodesic gives for me a funnel-like region. And I, in this region, I can draw my triangles and my spine edges. And simply what I have to do is project the shortest geodesics from the endpoints of my spine edges, so these are these green arcs, onto my closed geodesic. So it gives you a partitioning of my geodesic of length L into, in this case, uh, four segments. So it should be clear that you know, the, these, the lengths of the segments have to add up to L, but in fact there is an additional constraint that comes from the you know, identification of the inside and the outside of this annulus that requires that in fact the sums of the, the green segments are equal to the sums of the yellow segments. Okay? So these are the coordinates I'm going to put on my trees. So I have V's and W's on the vertices of the tree and angles on the ends of the edges of the tree. And then we can state the, the full bijective result. So here okay, I've summarized indeed the labels that I put on the tree. If I select a combinatorial plane tree with n white vertices that all have degree at least one, and red vertices of degree at least three, so those are exactly those intersections of the spine edges, then to such a combinatorial tree I can look at the set of allowed label assignments, <coughs> which are just positive real numbers that have to satisfy the constraints that I've written here. So the first one was just this area constraint of the triangles. The second one is just saying that if I run around a vertex of my spine that I should see exactly an angle of 2 pi, because I encounter each angle of a triangle twice, it amounts to summing the angles to pi. And then the constraints on these, uh, these boundary labels that I just described on the previous slide. Now what you should notice is that really these constraints define the polytope in some, some high dimensional space. And okay, the polytope will uh, depend on the way that my spine edges meet. Here's the bijection. If I look at the moduli space of hyperbolic surfaces with one distinguished cusp and an arbitrary number of boundaries of specified length, it's in bijection that the disjoint union over the finite number of combinatorial trees of these polytopes. Okay. Now this uh, may be useful or not. Uh, if you're interested in Wall-Peterson volumes, then this could be unuseful if the Wall-Peterson measure is complicated on this side. But, of course, the coordinates have been chosen in such a way that this is not the case. In fact, the Wall-Peterson measure 
pushed forward along this bijection to my polytopes is just the Lebesgue measure. Okay. Now I say this, but actually the dimension of these polytopes depends on my combinatorial tree. It will be of top dimension, so the dimension 2n minus 4 of my moduli space genus 0 with n plus 1 punctures, exactly when all the intersections of spine edges are of degree 3. You can understand that this is the generic situation, and having higher coordination there is some kind of coincidence for a hyperbolic surface. Okay? So a direct consequence of this uh, bijective result is that the well peterson volume is just the sum over all such finite mean many combinatorial trees of the Euclidean volume of this polytope. And what is the volume of this polytope? Well, what is the size of the polytope? Well, it's set by the boundary length and by pi, essentially. So it's going to be a monomial in an even power of pi, where the power is essentially the number of red vertices, and a power of the boundary length, which is simply the degree of the associated vertex in the tree. Okay? So if you like, you can think of this uh, bijective result as a combinatorial or geometric interpretation of the coefficients in these well peterson polynomials. Okay. Now here is a very short intermezzo, but maybe I should skip this uh, intermezzo in view of the time, is that this uh, tree bijection extends nicely to a situation where you have cone points instead of geodesic boundaries. Okay. But let me uh, go ahead because I wanted to uh, well, convince you that now naturally the string equation of these uh, generating functions of Will Peterson volumes it has an interpretation as a decomposition of these trees. Okay? So recall that R was my generating function of uh, surfaces with two marked cusps. And naturally, I can take one of them as the origin, and the other one will describe a leaf of my tree. So by the previous theorem, I can write this generating function as a sum over combinatorial trees, and then the volumes of the polytopes with specified boundary lengths Okay, uh, and then of course there should be uh, integrals over, uh, over these lengths with uh, the appropriate weight Q, which I forgot to write here. Um, so let's be a bit more precise about how we can compute these volumes of these polytopes. What makes it difficult is that for every <coughs> edge in my, uh, my spine, I have two angles sitting there, and there is a constraint between the two angles that they have to add up to something smaller than pi. So here's a little trick to make life a bit simpler. Let me perform an inclusion-exclusion operation, where now, for instance, here, instead of enforcing this constraint, I can consider the volumes without the constraint, and then, of course, subtracting the ones with the reverse constraint. More generally, I can express the sum over red trees in terms of a sum over trees where I've colored my edges in black and blue, where black edges have no constraint on the labels, and the blue edges have the reverse constraint. And if I include factor minus one to the power of the number of blue edges, then in this sum, the only contributions to the volume that will survive are the ones for which all the constraints of the red edges are satisfied, okay? Now, if we stare at trees of this type, we actually see that the polytopes associated to them factorize as a, a Cartesian product of a lot smaller polytopes. Because there were no relations between the coordinates that were sitting on the vertices and the angles. So 
for each vertex, so I have a very little polytope. And then there are no constraints on the red edges, or the black ones, sorry. So the kind of the, the, the minimal uh, polytopes that they get in the factorization correspond to the clusters of connected blue edges. So I can write now the sum over trees and in the volumes as a sum over two type trees where I've contracted the blue clusters into blue vertices and to each vertex there will be associated a volume. And the total volume is just a product of the volumes of the individual polytopes. So that means that my full generating function is really just of the form of a sum over trees with certain weights that depend on the, vert on the degrees of the vertices above columns. And in fact, we can uh, convince ourselves easily that for the white vertices where these, uh, our, our, our variables were simply a partition of my boundary of length L, I get a weight that is simply an integral over L squared with respect to my uh, weight Q. Now for the uh, blue vertices, one has to do a little bit more work where you can convince yourself, and I'm not going to explain the details, that we get exactly this contribution gamma k. Okay. So the full combinatorial interpretation of our string equation for Walt Peterson volumes is under control. So what can we do with this, except that we can derive the Walt Peterson volumes in a purely geometric fashion? Well, just as in the planar map case, the labels on the trees say something about global distances. So here is a, a result that you can directly derive from this uh, tree bijection. Let's look at the random hyperbolic surface that now has three distinguished cusps, zero, one, and two. So my random hyperbolic surface is really a, a random element of kind of the, the large union of moduli spaces for n, three or larger, with probability proportional to the, the measures I put in the boundaries and the Walt Peterson measure. I can then ask something about distances between those cusps. In particular, I can look at the distance d1 between the first cusp and the zero of one, and d2 between the second one and the zero of one and ask about the distribution. And in fact, the moment generating function, the Laplace transform of this random variable has a very explicit form using the tree bijection. It is given in terms of some power series Y of U that I've written here explicitly, but the exact uh, form is not important now. Um, but it's uniquely determined in terms of my power series R, which was the solution to this closed form equation, uh, and has no other input. So how does one arrive at such a formula? Well, I need to understand what happens to distances to the origin when I transverse my spine from my first labeled cusp, so that's one leaf of the tree, to the last leaf of the tree. When I do this, I will pass certain vertices of the tree, or in my white-blue colored tree, I have to jump over blue vertices and white vertices. And one can, by using some hyperbolic trigonometry, exactly determine what is the distribution of the change in distance when I jump over such a vertex. So since the sequence of events that occur when going from one leaf to the other, is really a sequence of encounters of white and blue vertices, I can write my expectation value as a geometric uh, series of the generating functions of you know, the, the, the events associated to the individual vertices. With some work, one can find the explicit formulas there, and then the general result follows. Okay, I guess I have Two minutes or so left. Three minutes, very good. 
Um, so just a, a short remark here. Uh, maybe some people that are used to the topological recursion of Walt-Peterson volumes will recognize the, the spectral curve here. Um, in fact, uh, this uh, moment generating function for this uh, distance statistic, it depends on my y of u, which also is a spectral curve, but now for a topological recursion, not of ordinary Walt-Peterson volumes, but uh, the tight Walt-Peterson volumes that Bart uh, mentioned yesterday. So this is just an observation, but it seems to be a general uh, observation that distance statistics are very closely tied to the spectral curve of the topological recursion of surfaces you're looking at. Okay. Um, another thing one can deduce from this analysis is the, the rough order of distances when I take the number of boundaries to be large simply by performing singularity analysis of my uh, power series on the right-hand side. And what we find is that if Q is sufficiently regular, just as in the planar map case, then these distances are of order n to the one quarter. So what happens when we take n to be large, normalize distance by n to the one quarter? Well, here is an explicit result in the special case where my weight is just a delta measure at zero, in that case, my random map will just have n cusps. And if I condition the number of cusps to be n, then really my random surface is just the, uh, well, the, the, the n times punctured sphere sampled proportionally to the Walt-Peterson measure on this moduli space. If we normalize the hyperbolic distances by n to the one quarter, and okay, there are different ways of phrasing this result, but if we take as the set, just the manifold itself, and turn it into a metric space with the hyperbolic distance, then in a gromov prokhorov topology, we can show that it converges in distribution to the Brownian sphere, just like the planar maps, using this tree bijection. Since I'm out of time, I'll leave this uh, theorem up here. So this is uh, together with uh, our organizer. And okay, we... <laughs> We're discussing uh, tonight uh, how to get rid of this little plus here. <laughs> Thank you.